Hi, I'm Mark Hall with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System here with the Ohio State University's Precision Ag Specialist, Dr. John Fulton. John, drones, UAVs, systems, how does the word system fit in there now? But boy, prices drop down. You can get a good drone package for less than $1,500. If not three or $400 today, for even with good the stuff. camera. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's been a hot topic here for, you know, the last five years, you know, kind yes. of flashed on the market. Uh, we do have some regulations. We, as a, as a, as a uh, farmer or someone supporting farmers, got to consider. And so you can find all that on the FAA website. It's a lot easier to fly legally today than it was a year ago. But, uh, but it's exciting. And we were talking about, you know, uh, there's potential you know, that they can be used as an effective tool yes. to, to scout, uh, collect some data. Um, and I think in long term, as we see some of this, and we'll show some examples today, they might be used for other things like actually collecting samples of leaves, uh, water sampling, um, really getting, you know, there's just a spraying, you know, doing some things that humans normally may have to do manually that they potentially could replace some of this scouting and some of these type activities. John, throughout our Precision Ag series, we've talked about data and big data, but you get to drones and particularly fixed wing or, man, data is, there is just terabytes or I don't know all them big words. Free to make in season decisions uh, and do things, you know, action things. I gotta go spray or do something. Uh, and that's going to be the critical thing uh, in my book, uh, or Smart Scout. Yes. You know, I think that's going to be an important thing. So let's talk about drones uh, in this lesson here, Mark. Um, um, there's a lot of different ones out there today, and, and uh, the market itself, I mean, Amazon doesn't sell thousands per month. It sells tens of thousands of these things per month. The consumers around the world, uh, there's a lot of different makes. Um, there's fixed wings, there's copters, uh, there's large, high, heavy, you know, large capacity ones, there's these little copters that can carry a camera. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, th uh, orientations and, and what I mean by that is, you know, the number of propellers or how they're made and what they can accomplish out there. And so a lot of different ones out there that are commercially available and I think we're going to see larger ones in the future that will come out onto the market that people can take advantage of. They can have that higher capacity to maybe carry a tank or carry some uh, mechanisms to do things out there in the field. I think for today's uh, lesson, I think we're talking about UAVs or unmanned uh, uh, vehicles or UASs or SUASs is what the FAA calls them. And that's anything, any of them that's less than 55 pounds. Uh, there's two distinct classes that I would call it that farmers or, or agronomists have access to. There's the multi-rotor, uh, and we can read down, you know, uh, currently what some of the, the characteristics of those are. The, I think the important thing is a, a multi-rotor can hover, so I can yes. sit over a spot. And then there's the fixed wing, uh, and these are typically a little bit more expensive, uh, can fly longer, uh, and uh, can collect, you know, cover more acres per hour per se, uh, carrying specifically the cameras. Um, but uh, these two different classes, I mean, these are decisions, but if you're just out scouting, probably a, a, a multi-rotor type scenario is gonna work for you. You can hover, you can get, get it in position and take the pictures, whereas a fixed wing, I think, is gonna be more towards trying to collect and generate data layers over larger areas and things. And so, you know, just something to think about as you, you go out. If you're new to this and, and you're wanting to fly, I would encourage folks, don't go spend a lot of money. Buy something that's pretty basic. Get it comfortable with it because the last thing I want you to do is go buy an expensive camera or put a camera on it and you put it up and you crash and, you know, you're out a little bit of dollar or a little bit of money on the cameras. And so as you get used to it, you're going to figure out how to take a um, – go cheap or go basic and then move up in terms of capacity and uh, functionality that it brings. So uh, a lot of options out there today, Mark, on, on both ends. Today we're talking high capacity. Uh, today this is, uh, we got this just an example of a DJI 1000 actually can carry 15 pounds of payload. 
And so when we think about the Amazons and, and the Walmarts that are playing in this game of trying to deliver packages, I mean, you know, I can put a little bit bigger camera on or I could build in some, some sampling mechanisms on these that, that can't be handled with the, with the smaller lighter. Uh, and so you're just, again, we're starting to see this progression of new uh, larger capacity uh, UAVs coming on the market as well that uh, we can think about. John, just a dream, just a perfect world kind of situation would be to have a UAV that had a camera that knew how to recognize a, a specific insect or specific yeah. weed and could fly and just treat the spot. And, and you know, the, with the cameras today, I mean, we think about our smartphones and the, and the quality of those cameras and think about m mounting those on. You know, I, I don't want to say that's right around the corner, Mark, but I mean, it, it's coming sooner than probably yeah. a lot of people think about. But with the, the size of the cameras, the quality of cameras, and, and image processing and analysis that you can do on board, those type of scenarios are becoming more real than where we were just five years ago. So, you know, it's, it's just let your mind wonder about how this might fit into an operation, farming operation. So, so that's kind of what we talked a little bit about. There's the, the rotors, they hover and you got your fixed wing. They're going to have to uh, glide or stay in flight and fly longer. And, and then you got the capacity or some considerations to make here. Uh, I borrowed this from um, one of our faculty here at uh, Auburn University, but uh, you know, just some fastest sets up. You got your, your UAV itself. You got a sensor, in this case, a camera that can be built right in or, or mounted on Comes that. with it when you That's buy That's right, it. you can buy it right with it. And again, very, very low cost yeah. to get a basic one. Uh, you can take your pictures over an area. Uh, in our case, uh, with the new certification or part 107, you're limited yes. really at 400 feet or below is what you're what we're talking about um, but that's that's a lot that's we can work with four yeah, plenty to, to do probably some of the things that we want to do I typically they'll have a controller they got apps today that can yes. communicate I mean I can watch the camera and switch between video and and uh, uh, still picture mode but I can get myself positioned to take a take a picture of course they got their GPS uh, enabled already that helps geofence it out of areas that they can't fly and then I can download or upload new firmware or download pictures very quickly. And for the new systems today, they're pretty much autonomous, Mark. I mean, I can, I can put waypoints out and, and once it lifts off, it goes and does its uh, mission and returns and set it down and you're done. And so we're to the autonomous stage on, on most of these or I can fly at least on the rotors with the RC or the, the apps that are available. It's just amazing. That, John, I've got a simple, a simple quadcopter that I got off of Amazon, and you just hit that go home button. It don't matter where it is. Yeah. It just flies right in and lands where it took off. Yeah, yeah, it's just amazing, just amazing. This is just an example on the left side. This is a, a fixed wing flight plan that was put together again uh, over a field, and and so you kind of geofence or what the area that you want to cover. Uh, you you put that mission is uploaded to that, it takes off, it completes that autonomously on itself, collects the pictures in this case along the way, and then it comes back and lands all, you know, we always say a successful flight is one that we never have to interrupt or even touch the yes. bird at all. On the right side, again, this is just an example on any of the rotors today that you just put out, uh, you know, in this case, five uh, way marks that takes off and it goes to number one, you tell at what height, take a picture, go to number two, take a picture. It can complete that, comes home, and, and again, all autonomously. It's just amazing the, the, the navigation systems that today that are already built into these, these fairly uh, cost-effective solutions. You know, the other big thing, and I mean, you gotta kinda go through this, is what cameras and then what imagery do you wanna get out of this? I mean, to me, the, the value is the imagery. The well, pictures. talk to us, big guy, for ag, what camera do we need for crop monitoring? Yeah, and so let's talk. I mean, first of all, do you want to take still shots? Do you want an image or do you want video? You know, you, some of these cameras can do both, so there's a combination. I think for most of the folks in, in ag, they're using uh, basically the, the camera functionality. Um, 
And on the bottom there, just reading down the uh, RGB, I can get visible pictures, I can get infrared cameras, I get a red edge camera, I get thermal cameras today, uh, multi-spec and hyperspec. They're, again, more expensive as you go down, and then there's some LIDARs that can be mounted on that give you uh, elevation or uh, DEM type um, data with that. If you are gonna use your drone for irrigation monitoring, yeah. what camera would you use? Well, when you say irrigation monitoring, I could use an RGB or visible camera and just fly up and down and check for, for uh, leaks, plugs, things like that, do a quick check down with my visible. If I want to try and manage and make scheduling decisions and such, uh, the thermal gives you stress plans versus non-stress, and so having a thermal camera, which is a little bit more expensive, uh, or something that gives me a combination of visible and infrared where I can do some calculated vegetative indices just to be able to know some differences in that crop health out there. And so that's the nice, it. what I want to show on this is if I want to get like an NDVI map, a lot of people talk about NDVI, typically, or at least in the past, I'd have to fly a visible camera. What does NDVI stand for? Normalized difference vegetative index and that's Thank you. been utilized as a crop health crop vigor measurement out there so um, but to, to do that NDVI image I need uh, typically the red band out of the visible so I need a visible camera and then I need an infrared or um, uh, camera as well today for example you look at those cameras up there the red edge or the sequoia there um, they actually can fly and give you both um, visible and infrared in case of sequoia. So I can make one flight, I collect a lot of bands, and not only can I get a visible out of it, I can actually do a calculated NDVI measurement yeah. as an example, Mark. But I, what I guess I'm telling you here is that the quality and, and with the capacity of these cameras uh, are growing. You can see the size of them, but to put them on um, and I suspect that the cost of those are going to be greatly reduced in the next two or three years. So a lot of different cameras. I hear what you're talking about, but these are some of the common ones that are accessible out there. Uh, if you just want to go basic, get you a GoPro and get you an, a visible one, at least start looking at crops at a different perspective. This is just an example. Uh, we won't go through all this, but again, what are you trying to accomplish if you get into this data layering piece? Uh, resolution is important. You can see the top top left there is not as high as resolution as the, the one on the right or the bottom there. You just lose some of that detail. But again, it gives me green being healthier, more lush plants versus the red areas being not as healthy and probably smaller plants in this case when that was taken mid midsummer. But, uh, you know, I also think if you're going to get into flying and you're trying to generate some of these images, you probably want multiple images per year. You know, going out and taking one snapshot can tell you a little bit, but if you're kind of comparing you know, it, yeah, comparing it and kind of following the crop along the year, it might not seem important that day. But when you get to that yield map and you're trying to go back and look at what happened during the summer or during the growing season, having those multiple images really can begin to help tell the story a lot of time. So just any, you know, resolution trying to collect multiple images over the over there and then deciding what kind of camera or what kind of information you want to get from it becomes pretty important. But uh, like I said, you take the left image versus the right image mark, a lot of different detail, a lot of different detail. And I would compare that on the left almost as your yield map because your yield monitor is not going to pick up some of the micro detail that's in that image. So resolution becomes pretty important, I think, in the tour because a lot of that you see lines and I don't think that's Mother Nature making those lines out no. there. And they're there. And they're there, and a yield monitor typically is not going to pick them up, whereas the imagery can, can expose some of the man-made issues that may be cropping up out here in this field. John, I think we're at a point today that it's, it's prudent for a farmer to have one of these in the back of his truck. And when he gets out in the field in the growing season, to just go up, go up 100 feet, 200 feet, take a quick look, if there's something big, bad happening out there, take care of it. And if not, come back down yeah. and go on to the next field. And we're going to show, let's, let's look at an example of this. Here's just, uh, again, not probably a, an exhaustive list, but a, just a list of uses for imagery. I really think the smart scouting, identifying yes. areas. We see a couple areas in that soybean crop I might want to go out and take a look at. 
Uh, in this case, it's probably herbicide damage, as we found out. But just identifying these and being able to be smarter in terms of your time going into the field, I think becomes very important. It's an efficiency thing. You learn more and you're out there looking at these differences that are showing up in the imagery. But there's a lot of other things in terms of identifying stress, identifying disease and other things, fertility issues. I mean, there's, and I think that list is just going to grow. But just it's just a list for, for everyone to kind of review and, and these, uh, to me, these, I can give you an example of someone in at least the U.S. that are using imagery for one of these items here, right here. So going to your point here, take your copter, you throw it up. This is down E.V. Smith through a couple of uh, examples here from Auburn. This is a corn crop. But again, it's about perspective. Because if I've, I advance, if I put that copter right down on the corn, that's what we're looking at versus when I get up and you start to look at, you know, that's a lot different perspective. And, you know, by God, I might want to go look at that area a little bit closer. Yeah. And so, like you say, you take these copters and just take one picture and be able to learn from that. And then, again, this, you know, I think about us looking from the end of the rows, we're kind of seeing this perspective versus this perspective. It's just a whole different world and different information different intel that you can learn about that field that may be of value to you as a, as a farmer or as an agronomist that's trying to scout. Just, some, just through this in, I think different types of images, not one image can be the tell-all either, but uh, I like to see what, how we're using it. I want to see that visible image on the left. I like to see an NDVI at the same time, and I like to see the thermal image. And take this for example, Mark, in these images. But if you notice an RGB and the NDVI, if you kind of take the, uh, see where the white line or where, where it's kind of cut out between the two, two projects, if you look on the left there in a visible or an NDVI, you don't see much difference, do you? Nope. But when you move over to thermal, you can see some early instances yes. of crop stress. Something going on there. Yeah, and so again, it's, all the images help you explore, and I always say that you may learn one thing out of one image, but not the other, but it's a combination. And these, again, all flown at one time and exposing different things about that corn crop in this case that, uh, that at least I know about. It may, yeah. you know, I may action against it, I may not, but uh, I think it's important to be able to, it's a suite of images that helps tell the story and gives you the learning and, and potential information that we're trying to generate. Plug sprinkler, going back, you asked me yes. about that. Here's, a, here's just an NDVI map that was pulled out, but you can clearly see that uh, there may be some other issues out there in the field, of course, but in this case, clearly we had a plug, plug nozzle or sprinkler in this case on this pivot, but you can pull that kind of stuff out. Blowing that image up that I was showing there, but you can see in this case some compaction issues. This was taken late July, Mark. This is corn. And the green, the green NDVI values in this is much healthier, much more yield potential at this stage than where the red, the red is, but you can still see some of those track marks that cause compaction and ultimately yield loss out there. If I was going to tell you as an example, again, a yield map would never show you the kind of details some of this imagery can. I mean, because at of different stages of growth. Absolutely. But I tell you, I think we're going to talk to our operators here a little bit about when we're getting out there and what we're doing. Because if you look at there's a vertical line in that bottom field, that's where they... Right where the grain buggy went. No, that's actually where the sprayer went. I just beelined it to go to the top. But, you know, and if I got a project out there, I might be thinking about how I need to harvest it to actually learn about the treatment and not bringing in the man-made and the natural variability of what I'm trying to learn. So just some thoughts on that. Just kind of thinking about future, Mark, and, and we'll bring this to an end. You know, we got, especially in Japan, this is the Yamaha chopper on the on the top left being sprayed in a in this particular case a vineyard. Uh, they've been testing this for a few years out in uh, um, California. Well, farmers are noticing that thing, John. They are paying attention. Yeah, and so, you know, we've been testing. There's a few, at least one in the United States, but in Japan they use them all the time. But uh, in the bottom right, that's a commercially available. I can you can go buy that thing today, on there on the bottom right. And so again, as we think doing some of the spot spraying, coupling the cameras. I mean, we're starting to see this trend come together, and that you mentioned earlier. So, here's an example out of the University of Nebraska. They've got basically uh, uh, test tubes on there, 
and they've got uh, um, essentially they can go out and take water samples. And uh, you know, I think they can carry either two or three water samples. They fly it out. You go down in the water, whatever depth, it's set it to, and collect water samples. Again, think about having to go out in a boat or something that used to be able to do that and, and do that more frequently and maybe even, yeah. you know, and I mean, these are just things that are coming down the pipe pretty quick uh, beyond some of the scouting tools that people are starting to work on. Man, for wildlife, um, for so many, it's not, we're thinking ag and we're talking precision ag, but this has gone to so many options, wildlife, water quality, livestock range management yeah and the livestock producers you know getting up and checking checking their livestock and yes. especially after a storm or um scenario you know a weather condition i mean if i can't get back there but i can i can put that up and go back there and check man gives me you know comp you know makes me feel good that hey everything's okay or hey i gotta i gotta deal with an issue so so that was kind of just bringing this to an end you know I think there's a lot of opportunities. We're still growing in this this idea around using UAVs, but as you mentioned, I think smart scouting using some of the basic ones that don't cost a lot. I think I get a different perspective as we've shown, and might be telling uh, to go check things, or maybe I need to get my insurance agent out there. So exciting times, my friend! Exciting times. Thank you for watching our Precision Ag videos. If you need help, contact this guy right here. <laughs> He'll help you. Thank you for watching.